afternoon, everyone. I'm Paul Benwell. And I'm Sophie Caesar. We're really excited to be hosting our second PBA uh, A Year in Review. It's been a tumultuous year, to say the least. But we have learned anything from the past. The markets are cyclical. And it is in these markets where opportunities can be found. Uh, this brings us to today's presentations. Sophie? So well said, Paul. Uh, the format today is going to be a little different than our other webinars. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Hector Bremner from Avricor, uh, who will present, and then we will follow with some Q&A that you can ask in the boxes at the bottom of your screen or in the chat. Um, I will ask them to uh, Hector, and then afterwards, uh, we're having uh, Dr. Alan Davidoff from uh, Zortex will join us, and we will do the same format. He will present followed by questions. And then we hope to wrap that all up within this lunch hour. Um, so Paul, go ahead. Yep, Avricor is a pharmacy service innovator focused on acquiring and developing uh, early stage technologies aimed at moving pharmacy forward. Uh, and with us today is Hector Bremner, the CEO. And Hector, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. And uh, thanks for coming uh, with us today. So, uh, well, it's really great to be here with everybody again. And, uh, you know, I think we had uh, a great time uh, on this uh, webinar before, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, taking questions. And I'll quickly run people through what we're doing as um, uh, Paul and Sophie mentioned, uh, we're a pharmacy focused healthcare technology company uh, focusing on the emerging trend that's happening in this very large sector. So one point six trillion dollar U.S. business globally, the pharmacy, and they are going through this fee change, this this sort of Airbnb moment or or Uber moment, where where they are moving away from dispensing and getting into more hands-on services that are critically needed. I'm sure uh, wherever you are, uh, the headlines are dominating. Uh, headlines are dominated by stories around access to care, full hospitals, and um, rampant acute and infectious disease. And so if we're going to address that, we need to focus on healthcare, not disease care. And the pharmacy is a great place to get engaged with patients early, keep them on track, keep them on their therapies, uh, and most importantly, screen and detect uh, in time to be able to intervene at the correct time. Uh, which is lower costs and uh, to the healthcare system, uh, but also great opportunities for, for companies like ours. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we're doing that. So uh, healthcare obviously is going through this rapid change. It's, it's so uh, prevalent in, in this post-pandemic world. We, we saw it during the pandemic, but we can see that every flu season um, that um, very strong viral pneumonias are going around, even if it's not COVID. Um, RSV, uh, which is a respiratory illness <clears throat> that can really typically impact children, um, is also impacting uh, seniors. But the reason why it impacts people is because they have underlying healthcare conditions. We always hear about the story about, you know, Ted or Jane were perfectly healthy and then they got struck down by something. And, and they're not healthy. It's just that the reality of our healthcare is, is that uh, we don't know until something traumatic happens. The so, you know, American um, uh, Medical Institute earlier this year put out an interesting uh, report where they said the first sign of uh, cardiovascular disease is usually the heart attack or stroke for most people. And that um, is avoidable. And the community pharmacy is a great piece of the puzzle uh, where it's been underutilized. We have great healthcare professionals uh, and with the right technology, uh, they can uh, address this issue and support physicians and the hospital system. And to this point, chronic disease is what's the driver. So um, even during the pandemic, uh, people that had uh, underlying uh, cardiovascular disease or particularly diabetes, which is a very high prevalence, one uh, and three Canadians have prediabetes or diabetes, uh, those people were really tipped over by these sudden infections. And so we really need to address these. So it's, it's obviously a big cost to healthcare, but um, it's also a big cost in our families and our own personal health. But again, it's addressable. We just need to be able to intervene early and make uh, screening and testing the first step, not an emergency room video or <laughs> video and <laughs> visit rather. I'm on video. 
So pharmacy is transforming, as I've mentioned, and uh, our pharmacists are really enthusiastic in uh, embracing uh, this shift in this move. And, um, you know, it's an exciting time. Uh, people are realizing uh, that their profession is in the midst of this once in a lifetime change, and they're excited to come into work every day. And the stories, the anecdotal stories are, are really powerful about um, being able to intervene in, uh, in a critical moment with a patient and, and save lives. And so that's um, you know, why I think anybody gets involved in healthcare and you know, pharmacists uh, are really excited about moving into services. It's been talked about for a lot of years. The pharmacy did so well during the pandemic of being the front line of care that now the policy is starting to catch up and they're getting the expanded scope of practice that they need to be able to do this work. So Alberta led the way, uh, they have a, a very broad scope of practice that allows them to do um, minor ailment treatment and, and certain uh, um, prescri prescribing, uh, as well as uh, testing. Uh, in January, on January 1st uh, of the upcoming year, Ontario will join that, and that's very important. It's one of the most populous parts of the country. And uh, British Columbia has announced that by uh, about summer of next year, um, they will be also uh, dramatically expanding scope of practice for pharmacy. And finally, the Maritimes is expected to be launching some innovative pilots where they're going to be funding pharmacy to do more services and, and evaluating that. And it's uh, it widely expected, I think. Yeah, all bets are that it's going to be wildly successful uh, based on the data that we've been generating already. So um, the reality is, is that um, government and policymakers are finally meeting uh, um, the market demand and pharmacy is ready and prepared to invest and go in this direction. So a uh, very important piece to the puzzle here to understand. And the way uh, that you can really serve patients is with point of care testing. And uh, point of care testing is anything that happens outside of a hospital or a laboratory. So it's a really broad catch-all term. It can mean all kinds of things, like from your, you know, Apple Watch to your, um, uh, you know, glucose meter if you if you have diabetes. Um, but uh, many of you use point of care tests uh, during COVID. But the now uh, shift, the, the shift that needs to occur now is how do we move high quality point of care instruments that. Um, are not, um, you know, simply a toss of a coin 50-50 right or wrong uh, in terms of um, effectiveness and uh, uh, the technology and the test. But how do we take laboratory, truly laboratory grade instruments and we bring it into a setting uh, where it's cost effective and that it is going to be easily scaled within the community pharmacy. And we have cracked that nut, but this is an important um, market to address. Uh, it's got about a 9.6 CAGR. Uh, it's started the decade at around $36 billion. It's expected to finish this decade uh, about three times that. And that number might even be conservative given the amount of investment and focus on this area. So uh, point of care testing on top of pharmacy, a really, really exciting area for investment and innovation. Uh, patients are driving this uh, beyond what I've been talking about. I mean, obviously, pharmacists and, and healthcare teams want to do this, and, and government uh, is happy to support them, but neither would really be doing it if the patient wasn't really driving the conversation. And let's be clear, all of us, uh, you know, don't take a backseat to our health anymore. We have apps on our phones. We're actively engaged in some sort of healthy activities, at least for most of us, and uh, we are all um, having this conversation, uh, many of you have probably done your 23andMe or Ancestry or some sort of pharmacogenomics or, or uh, uh, some sort of genetic test to, to learn more about your health. So more data now than ever is available and patients have learned that uh, they can access this information. They want this information. They want to make decisions using real information rather than um, the doctor simply listening to your chest with a stethoscope and telling you you're fine. People don't want to hear that. They want real data. And point of care testing uh, can do that. And the community pharmacy is probably the most equitable place that people could access it. No special membership required, and everybody has a pharmacy close to them. So we're focused on building the world's largest and most reliable point of care network in community pharmacies. And we're doing that with our uh, proprietary cloud-based solution, which connects to leading third-party instruments, which we provide the pharmacy as a part of our total package. And this schematic here gives you kind of a rough idea of how uh, and what HealthTab is. So patients create an account, they 
um, get to keep their information, of course, and they get to uh, be able to access that information at any time. Um, they agree to terms and conditions and provide consent, so it's, it's all patient-led. Uh, during the consultation with the pharmacist, the pharmacist will use the customized health survey within the program uh, based on the, the, the data entered by the individual uh, to work them through a, a, a tailored consultation. A test is conducted on the instrument on site. That information uh, out of the instrument, along with the survey, is merged in real time in automated fashion. Our software is doing calculations, uh, in a variety of calculations to make sure that these results are um, taking into account a variety of, of uh, formulas used to uh, average out results based on age, race, sex, uh, medication history, current condition. And so they get a personalized report. Uh, it's easy to read, easy to under interpret and understand. There's little pop-ups that give an individual some insights as to what these results mean. And the physician can access, uh, or a pharmacist and, and physician could access this information as well based on the consents provided. And the last piece of it is, is that de-identified information is also generated here. And this is really critical because real world evidence and real world evaluations uh, are uh, some of the most important movements in healthcare data today. Um, it uh, drives uh, how to uh, apply resources, what's really going on in treated populations. And it's critical uh, to be able to study people outside of the usually faulty traditional clinical trial process where the pool is small and it's a limited amount of time. Uh, De-identified real-time data, it gives you uh, a much, it's, it's basically like testing every human. So you're able to generate uh, data that's much more meaningful. And that's important because um, uh, the FDA, uh, the CE in Europe, uh, Health Canada have all mandated that um, drug makers must include more real, real world data, uh, real time evidence on um, uh, the approval process and also post-market sur uh, surveys uh, and, and monitoring. So this is really critical that uh, there's a big market out there looking for real world evidence and Health Tab can provide that across hundreds of if not thousands of pharmacies around the world in real time uh, using high quality analysis. So this is what uh, the uh, page would look like for the patient. Um, you're getting up to 23 biomarkers. You, you technically, you know, th this is just currently, I mean, the health tab platform can intertwine with just about any instrument or uh, we can integrate those instruments and make sure that um, if there's a demand for a particular test or a particular uh, focus, it can be integrated. Uh, but right now we're very focused on uh, diabetes and heart disease. Uh, as well as uh, uh, we have uh, liver and kidney function focus and um, infectious disease. So we do that with uh, thank and thanks to our partners at Abbott. Um, we have uh, several distribution agreements with Abbott and we're really proud of that. These are very unique. They've never done this before. Um, normally distribution agreements are reserved for uh, sort of classical uh, distributors of healthcare technologies, sort of regional, um, but uh, they have really leaned in on this idea of bringing these instruments, which typically live in a, in a hospital setting, so an, an acute care setting uh, where a physician or a nurse needs a result in, in you know, real time, they, they need something just quick. Um, so these instruments are very high quality. They're meant uh, typically for acute care settings, but um, they can be, uh, and we have proven, very effective in pharmacy. Typically a little bit more expensive for a pharmacy. So we also disrupt that and I'll explain how we uh, make that work for them. But um, right now we've deployed over 416 uh, and growing uh, Affinion 2s, which are focused on diabetes and heart disease in Shopper's Drug Mart pharmacies across Canada. Um, we anticipate being able to do work with the ISTAT. The ISTAT is a very interesting instrument that allows you to do kidney function uh, and liver function, which is, um, uh, is a really important marker. And we're also currently uh, testing, um, along with Shoppers Drug Mart and Abbott, in a, sort of in a collaborative way, uh, looking at infectious disease monitoring in community pharmacy with the ID Now. And the ID Now is um, a swab test. It's a, um, a thermonucleic acid uh, molecular test that uh, is a confirmatory result for uh, obviously COVID, but uh, influenza, A and B, uh, strep, and RSV. 
And this uh, has really powerful implications as to how the, the pharmacy can play a role in preventing, preventing uh, highly infectious disease uh, spread by a, you know, encouraging patients to get identified early and uh, also getting them on the right therapies. Uh, you know, we have a big problem with the overutilization of antibiotics, for example. So if you can confirm that the individual does not need antibiotics, uh, then that's great. So uh, we have uh, about five locations running the ID now uh, at the moment, and uh, it's being observed. And uh, obviously, government's taking a look at the data that's going to be generated, and ultimately, uh, we'll see where that goes. And uh, I believe that seasonally, um, infectious disease study in the pharmacy is going to have um, you know a big role to play. But the real uh, volume of testing and the real amount of, of work we will be doing will, will be focused on chronic disease, um, which is impacting pretty much half of the population at any particular time. So uh, we will remain fo very focused on the opinion and uh, ISTAT. And, and hopefully one day, uh, you know, the opinion will be able to do the ISTAT tests uh, for, for kidney function and electrolytes. Um, we know that that's in the pipeline. It's being reviewed and, and hopefully uh, we'll get approvals, but it'll be some time. So we'll, we'll need to use two instruments for the time being. So uh, now how does it work? So revenue works in, in a bunch of different ways for us, but it, it's important to understand there's about 100,000 pharmacies and just a near-term addressable market. That's Canada, United States, uh, UK. UK. <clears throat> and so we charge a uh, per location fee uh, so to have the system on site, that includes the instrument and the uh, software, as well as the um, oversight program that we offer, which is a quality assurance program, um, which is a, uh, run out of a, a lab here in Vancouver called SQL, which is one of five CDC approved labs for reference method. And so uh, this lab um, uh, is uh, the same lab that uh, many of the major labs use to um, uh, objectively uh, review their own um, processes. So we're really proud of this. This is the only point of care testing program that's overseen in this way uh, and makes it by far uh, the most uh, successful uh, or sophisticated rather, it's the, it is the most successful, but it is the, also the most sophisticated approach for point of care testing. And uh, because of our distribution agreements with the manufacturer, we, we offer this one window solution. So uh, we're, we're providing the system fee uh, on a per location basis, but we also distribute the tests. And so uh, we make a margin on that and we do quite well and uh, more volume, more revenue. So um, we will make more revenue through more locations, of course, but we can also make more revenue through existing locations as they uh, refine processes and, and um, you know, uh, do more tests. So you know, what does that mean in terms of uh, you know, dollars and cents of it all? So you, a baseline store will generate around $1,000 a month for us, which is great. And we, we have stores that are doing you know, four or five times that. So they're, they're very focused on, on testing. It really depends on the location, the patient profile, and the focus of the team. But we don't think that the superstar stores are outliers. They're just windows into the future. It's very important to remember that this is an innovation that's occurring, a change that's occurring. This is not something that's commodified by any means. This isn't all baked in. It's 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 baked in that it's happening, but it's, it's, it hasn't really fully matured. And so that's what's exciting is that there's really a, a, a lot of blue sky ahead for this industry and, and for what we're doing, uh, because it's only just beginning to be realized. And um, once pharmacies have the system on site, uh, they become very enthusiastic about it. And certainly I can tell you that Every major pharmacy group has made announcements where they are changing store footprints. They're, they're closing stores to reinvest in, in footprints. They're, they're opening new divisions, all focused on services, point of care testing, and uh, even clinical trial divisions uh, in the United States with, with Walgreens and Walmart. So it's very important to understand that the industry is clearly moving in this direction. Policy is moving in this direction. And those superstar stores, we think, are a window into um, really the, the next year or two uh, ahead, you'll kind of, that'll be more of an average, but there'll be uh, a lot of growth in the near term. 
So this year, uh, we're our objective, we're, our agreement that we have right now is to get up to 450. Um, we're just shy of that right now at about 420. Um, but we will continue to grow next year substantially uh, and the years after. So uh, our business development hopper is full, both domestically in Canada, and we anticipate being international in 2023. Uh, Abbott has been an amazing partner. I just want to give them a quick shout out. They've been really leaning in on this and, you know, globally, um, you know, there's a lot of excitement about what we can do together and we're continuing to mature that relationship. Uh, but they've been, uh, you know, Daniel St. Pierre and the team here in Canada has uh, really leaned in and, and been fantastic innovators. So uh, just to kind of close out some quick thoughts here, we're first to market. We're the only uh, Point of care testing program with a quality control uh, program included by a reference method laboratory, uh, making it by far the most sophisticated. Uh, the data is harmonized. It's powerful because we're using the same analyzers in locations. And without taking you too far down into the nitty gritty of this, it's just that uh, a lot of programs and research programs are using analyze different analyzers, and different analyzers have different reference ranges. It means you know, one manufacturer, the number means one thing and it, and it could mean something else on another. So, we, you know, it's very important to use the same analyzers and we have that um, clear data. And because they're all cloud connected, uh, we're also just able to see and control uh, any outliers and make sure that the program from a, a data generation uh, and, and clinical practice point of view is, is, is integral. Um, easily integrated, it's very plug and play for the pharmacy that gets uh, up and running very quickly. Um, and we've proven, you know, just in the last half of the year that we could deploy um, almost 450 locations uh, very quickly and, uh, and that could be adopted quickly. Um, we're pharmacy focused. Uh, we think that this is um, a big market and it's important for us to specialize and focus on something that is uh, where there's a big gap. And most importantly, and the reason why we're six, more successful than other uh, point of care testing programs is that we're, we're patient led. So the patient is directly engaged in this and they're really driving the value on this. They get to keep their data, they're driving the conversation and that is uh, seeing much higher volumes than um, of testing and engagement than um, the program, like the standalone, just having a machine, uh, the patient being on the other side of the clipboard, so to speak. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're really setting a new standard as to the way that uh, patients can engage on this and it's working. And so uh, Shoppers Drug Mart, Canada's largest pharmacy, uh, really leaned in on us and we're really grateful. We're continuing to uh, do some very exciting work with them, including being in their first in Canada pharmacy walk-in clinics. Um, so that's a very exciting platform. and goes to show how uh, pharmacy can impact healthcare and the way point of care testing can serve patients in new ways. Um, our original pilot was a runaway success. Uh, it was 53 locations. The data that came out of that was incredible. 30% of patients were getting new prescriptions and uh, three in five patients were uh, having a direct intervention in their healthcare. 90% of patients learned something new about their health. So the data was overwhelming. And so uh, the choice was uh, to get out of pilot and move towards scale. And uh, we've completed uh, just about the first uh, phase of the scale. And so um, we expect uh, more uh, aggressive growth uh, with them and others in uh, the new year. A uh, little bit about the pharmacy walk-in clinic, which I mentioned. Uh, so our roadmap uh, is the year closes. I just, you know, we checked these boxes. Uh, you know, we completed the shoppers rollout. Um, we're um, well down the road on expanding the Canadian network. Uh, we'll be talking about that as soon as we can. And uh, we've been driving volume. Uh, volume has consistently been increasing and uh, we've been developing new markets. So we're very confident that our game plan uh, for 22, um, that we've been successful. And uh, we think the, um, you know, our, our revenue targets have, uh, in our quarters have been proving that. And we're very excited and very bullish about um, achieving our objectives for 2023. So uh, we have a very low burn rate uh, where we don't require to spend a lot of money to make money. Um, and we uh, keep a decent amount of cash on hand. We just had a lot of cash outlay because we just bought a lot of machines. We're, we're all self-funded for that. Um, and now we're uh, generating uh, that revenue back. Um, so you know, people will uh, be excited to see how the numbers evolve throughout this year. Um, you know, our cap table is uh, healthy and um, you know, we're uh, not planning on going to markets for new raises. If, you know, we can, if we're going to raise new money, it'll be through conventional debt primarily. 
uh, just some quick projections on uh, sensitivities is looking at numbers of stores and number of, of tests per day. So uh, we present this to, you know, low, you know, we would achieve this, you know, pretty much if we just like maintain just what we have. Uh, but we will expect to see, um, uh, and we're, to be clear, we're, we have our foot on the gas and we're pushing hard. So um, you know, you can see what it looks like, um, you know, as and when we are successful in expanding the network internationally and domestically. Uh, you can see what that looks like in terms of um, the numbers. And so um, you know, we think that uh, we can close out next year with a very um, uh, strong balance sheets, uh, assets will continue to increase, cash flow is going to look great. Um, currently, Health Tab, uh, which is a wholly owned subsidiary, is uh, cash flow positive, um, but uh, we expect Avricor to be in cash flow positive. Uh, likely by Q2 of uh, this upcoming year, and um, we will be able to maintain that. So uh, we're not like uh, many companies that do, uh, you know, it's always exciting to say that you're doing $900 million a year in gross revenue, but, you know, when we look at their balance sheets, you know, they're clearing, uh, you know, 1% of that at the end of the day. We're kind of the opposite. We um, are generating really great cash flow. Um, you're going to see a very healthy balance sheet. You're going to see really strong cash controls and us, us not, you know, blowing the doors off on spending to make new dollars. And uh, we're one of the most exciting stories out there. And uh, we'll hopefully, hopefully you'll agree and uh, keep your eye on us. Actually, that was very, very exciting, Hector. Thank you. I, um, I forgot how informative these webinars could be. It was, uh, it was great hearing the stories. So thank you very much. Well, no, I, was good. I didn't lay too much on you. It was, no, it's, it's, it's it was a lot phenomenal. Of it was phenomenal. So oh, we have a good. couple of questions. We'll, we'll get through them. Yes. Um, so what are the limits to the type of tests you can do? Uh, well, the limits would only really be to the scope of practice to the pharmacy. So, you know, we focus on what the pharmacist can do. So, you know, there's all kinds of weird and wonderful tests you can do and things like that, but you have to ask yourself two questions. We always have to ask ourselves, not you, but we have to ask ourselves two questions. <laughs> um, is it relevant to the pharmacy customer? Like, like, is the person in the pharmacy, are they concerned about that issue? Or is that, is that something that, you know, they're going to want um, or need? And then two, can the pharmacist even do it? Uh, okay. But uh, to give you some insights of things that we're looking at, um, all the major blood glucose meters, which are the devices that individuals with di di people with yes, diabetes course, yeah. use to measure uh, their daily blood glucose, um, they've all reached out to us and we're actively uh, pursuing conversations where you'll start to see uh, blood glucose meters uh, attached to health tab. That time and range data is going to be really powerful to add to our offering. Um, the virological testing, you know, there's, um, you know, obviously we're offering uh, the, the infectious disease. Uh, there is a lot of interest on sexually transmitted disease uh, uh, testing and which the uh, ID now can do. And so there is um, interest from government's perspective of being able to offer that on site. So that's another example. The ISTAT, which I mentioned, which does the um, liver and kidney function, that instrument recently had a test approved that can uh, test for the early indications of concussion. So if, you know, the beer league uh, got a little out of control, you smacked your head, you, you, you know, you're not really sure. Um, instead of emergency rooms and, and long wait times, you know, you can pop into a pharmacy and request this test. And uh, there could be a future where people would uh, be tested on the ISTAT in the pharmacy and understand uh, uh, the level of severity of of that bump on the head. So, you that's know, right. parents obviously would be very concerned about that. So this is some examples of places that we can go, but I really want to just close this thought on, you don't need to think about weird and wonderful. You don't need to think about like oncology or all these other chronic disease is 10 times bigger than COVID. It is 10 times mm -hmm. bigger than it is the number one killer out there. And it is not the weird and wonderful things that are killing us. It is acquired disease, which is easily avoidable predominantly acquired type two diabetes and acquired cardiovascular disease. And the reason that it's so damaging is that uh, culturally we sort of accepted it and we've sort of culturally accepted that once it's really, really bad, then we do something about it. The pharmacist's argument is that we can engage early and you could be on maybe some omega-3s and fiber supplements, not on insulin. And so, but 
it, data is so critical. Having that test, having that touch point with the, uh, the patient, sitting down with them and using this information in a practical way, that's what gets them on the right track. Um, and so I, I really want to underscore, this is globally a massive, massive opportunity is serving chronic disease. So let me ask you a, a follow-up question to that. Is the adaptation or the adoption by the pharmacist, I, I mean, are they willing to be at that level? Like it, you mentioned, you know, putting someone on omega-3s. Is that, you know, are they at that level or do they want to like have the patient be prescribed something immediately or they rather be preventative rather than, um, you know, prescribing something? It, it's in all of the above. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned the omega-3 and fiber thing because it was actually our pharmacist that taught us that. I mean, I, I was we were doing store <laughs> tours and they were merchandising supplements right next to Health Tab, which um, uh, you, you, you saw the machines. I mean, yeah. I, I guess I could, you know, I, you know, we don't have a lot of time, I'm sure, but I could show you a picture of what the, the system looks like on site. It's very small and it fits into the pharmacy uh, workspace very easily. But the point is, is that the pharmacy has a variety of ways that it wants to modify its business. The, um, uh, it's very important to understand that the the, the days of just simply dispensing pills are over. And this has been a long conversation, but it, they're not going to be even doing it necessarily on site. I can, I can tell you right now that um, if you look at, and I'll just quickly, uh, just for context for people, I just want you to see this. Uh, this is kind of what the system looks like in store. So you can oh, wow, see that perfect. it doesn't yeah. take up a, yeah, it doesn't take a, a lot of bench space, right? This is very small. You can even have multiple instruments. Um, they're the size of like desk phones, so they're not very big. But you can see that this doesn't um, take up tons of space. It's very easily integrated. Um, but the the concept here is that the pharmacist, they're happy if you're just on supplements <laughs> or, and not full-blown uh, disease. But uh, with the, the, the data is very clearly showing that um, as I mentioned, uh, dispensing is, is coming to an end. Central fill is sort of happening. Like I, I even understand that Shoppers Drug Mart, our, our um, Keystone client at the moment, they are moving towards a model where um, if you're on a chronic medication, the, the prescription is sort of filled off site and it arrives at the pharmacy sort of blister packed and ready to go. So that filling of prescriptions, uh, pill bottles is even that, that physical task is being done somewhere else. So they are going to have more time on their hands. Um, they're building out more uh, consultation rooms, um, but um, foot traffic, you know, the reality is, is that uh, one of the more interesting comments from shopper, shoppers to us was, is, I, and I like this, is I think brick and mortar pharmacies view something like Amazon, not other pharmacies as their competition. Mm -hmm. So what do they do to uh, be the counterweight and the necessary counterweight to this movement of just purely online healthcare? There's a real desire for people just to have something tangible and they're in the brick and mortar business. They, they're pharmacies, but they also are retailers. So foot traffic, yeah. uh, being able to, um, be a place of primary care access, like you saw with the, the pharmacy walk-in clinic. Physicians' offices are obviously difficult to get into, um, but for minor issues, um, the pharmacist is saying, and the government has agreed and already announced the policy changes, and the, we believe the funding is coming, that you're going to see more of that happen at the community pharmacy. So there's a lot of really positive things that are happening here. And we're really grateful that we have the opportunity, uh, being a relatively small company, partnering with really great, you know, the, the Canada's largest pharmacy group and um, Abbott. So uh, yeah. Yeah, we're, great we're really grateful. Yeah, very much. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, we probably could do a whole hour asking you all these questions. I've taken a we'll... lot of your time. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's been <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, so we'll have to have you back. Uh, but we yeah, will... we'll have to bring you back. So that's uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, part uh, part two. Well, hopefully I haven't eaten up too much of your time, but I just appreciate everybody's uh, oh, listening. Thank you, Rector. And... Appreciate it. Uh, no, right. we'll stay uh, after stay online, and uh, you know we'll uh, we'll come to you at the uh, at the end of Alan's presentation. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Good afternoon, Alan. How are you? Good afternoon. Very nice to uh, be able to present today. I'm just going to give a small introduction. Uh, Zortec Therapeutics, a biotechnology company, is dedicated to developing innovative therapies to improve the quality of life of patients with progressive kidney disease. 
uh, which ties in a lot with what uh, Hector was saying about testing for diabetes. So go ahead, Dave, uh, Alan, and uh, we're, uh, uh, we'll have questions for you at the end of this uh, presentation. Thanks. All right, I'll just share my screen. Are you able to see the uh, presentation? Uh, yes, we can. Great. Uh, well, welcome to uh, to listeners, and thank you to uh, Paul and the and the team for uh, providing this opportunity to present to you today. Uh, Zortex Therapeutics is a company working on a class of drug called xanthane oxidase inhibitors. In fact, our name is an acronym for xanthane oxidase reducing technologies. We're focused on inhibiting this enzyme uh, in, the, in the case where disease is progressing, especially kidney disease. This enzyme, xanthane oxidase, is critical for taking high concentrations of RNA, DNA, purines within our uh, circulatory system after a big meal or certain types of foods and turning it into uric acid for excretion. So in health, uh, this act enzyme is active every, day, every moment of our lives. However, in the case of uh, certain types of diseases like diabetic kidney disease and uh, in the case of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, our lead area of focus, this enzyme becomes pathological and drives, acts as an accelerant on the progression of disease. This presentation is available if you scan the upper right uh, QR code, and there's a recent analyst report uh, if you scan the lower uh, QR code. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, we seek safe harbor. There are future looking statements and projections and plans that may or may not uh, occur on a timely basis or at all. We're, for, we're working as a company in developing therapies for the progressive kidney disease space. Generally speaking, these are chronic kidney diseases. And there are very few therapeutic options. In fact, the best way to estimate the market today is to estimate the, no the cost of providing health services to individuals who've lost their kidney function, so end-stage renal disease, and the cost of dialysis. We know that worldwide there is a, a rapid growth of obesity and type 2 diabetes. And about 40% of individuals will have uh, progressive kidney disease associated with their type 2 diabetes in their lifetime. The estimates for uh, the growth of diabetes and so uh, secondarily diabetic kidney disease is a doubling in the next eight years and then a doubling again in the eight years following that. So we see a a growing, rapidly growing need in this space, very few therapeutic options. And we think we can be the first to introduce this class of drugs to slow the progression of disease. It's notable for each of these programs, we have patent applications and or granted patents in the US, Europe and other jurisdictions to cover our three individual therapies for these unique progressive kidney diseases. Our lead program is XRX008 for autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. There are approximately 150,000 individuals in the US who have very few therapeutic options. There is a drug at present uh, that was approved, a single drug that was approved in 2018 uh, that is uh, earning about 700 uh, million in revenue in the US each year, uh, despite the fact that it's really only addressing 5% of individuals uh, in this population. That leaves 95% of individuals or approximately 95% uh, with no therapeutic options other than blood pressure uh, management drugs. We think there is a excellent opportunity as we move forward with this program into a phase three trial in 2023 to advance it, uh, potentially gaining accelerated approval and potentially gaining full approval over the course of a small uh, single registration trial. 
We also have a program for the treatment of acute kidney injury due to coronavirus infection in individuals that are hospitalized. And we have new chemical entities that we're developing in this class of drug uh, with anti-inflammatory properties for diabetic nephropathy. So advancing those in an early stage. It's notable that our team is very experienced with this class of drugs and the development of oxypurinol, having worked uh, on the manufacturing and chemistry and research and development side for this drug for uh, more than 10 years. So our lead program, XRX008 for polycystic kidney disease, is relying on 505B2 development pathway. There has been a lot of work with this drug in uh, as a replacement for allopurinol with phase one and phase two testing. We have taken oxypurinol, which was filed as an NDA and received an approvable letter by the FDA, but never approved worldwide, and reformulated it in a way that provides substantially increased bioavailability. That gives us the opportunity to dose in kidney disease, but specifically in polycystic kidney disease, across the therapeutic range where we think we can have the greatest impact in slowing the progression of disease. Discussions with the FDA have suggested that a single two-year study, two-year treatment period study in polycystic kidney disease should be sufficient to gain approval uh, in this indication because it's a rare disease and it's or orphan drug designation eligible. Most of this talk will focus on the evidence and how we're proceeding to advance this into uh, late stage registration trials. We have, as a company, over the course of the last two years, uh, gained a NASDAQ listing and a TSX venture listing, and raised approximately $20 million in order to characterize this new proprietary formulation of xanthane oxidase inhibitor, uh, oxypurinol, in its new formulation, XRX008. We have completed two parts of a pharmacokinetic bridging study. These parts are essential to understand what dose we would recommend for our phase three registration trial in polycystic kidney disease, but also model the pharmacokinetics as part of the package that would be submitted for marketing approval with the FDA once that phase three trial is successfully completed. Uh, based on our phase three, pre-phase three meeting with the FDA in September of this year, we had excellent feedback and guidance on how to optimally design that study. We're revising our phase three protocol that should be sub submitted uh, under a special protocol assessment negotiation uh, in the near term. We're also diligently working on an orphan drug designation that should be filed before the end of the year. And that sets the stage for initiation of a phase three single registration trial for this indication uh, in the first half of this year. We also believe that there is an opportunity for accelerated approval in the conduct of this trial. And I'll talk about a little bit about that later. And we, we believe that there is, because we're at a late stage of clinical development, uh, potential for a significant licensing deal uh, in the near future. We also continue based on our discussions to file new patents to extend that patent life and coverage in ADPKD, but more generally in uh, kidney disease and cardiovascular disease. So we're taking a drug that has gained an approvable letter from the FDA. We're reformulating it to enhance its oral bioavailability that allows us to predictably dose across the therapeutic range, which we think is applicable. It's a xanthane oxidase inhibitor. So our goal in progressive kidney disease is to turn off the function of the xanthane oxidase inhibitor at least 90% using an oral tablet with this new formulation and deliver it to individuals in, those, in that phase three trial. We think there are a number of mechanisms of injury that are taking place in polycystic kidney disease patients. 
in about half of individuals at midlife, 35 to 40, they have hyperuricemia, about 50% in middle stage uh, individuals and about 90% in individuals with moderate to late stage progressive kidney disease. This population of individuals would have saturating levels of uric acid, which forms fine needle-like crystals. They can impale circulating cells. There are recent studies suggesting that uric acid deposition also impales the lining of blood vessels like the aorta or the coronary arteries of the heart, and that can limit and drive atherosclerosis, the development of, of cardiovascular disease, in addition to uh, increasing the rate at which kidney stones are formed in these patients by about four to six fold. So we think simply lowering uric acid in, in the circulation using a xanthine oxidase inhibitor will minimize, optimally minimize these effects over time. And that should contribute to a better quality of life. However, there are additional mechanisms of injury that are occurring. As these uh, kidneys go from fist size in a younger 20-ish individual to middle age, and then finally for half of all individuals at age 55, they've lost their kidneys. They've lost the fine filtering units or nephrons in their kidneys over that time, such that these kidneys look uh, much like a roll of bubble wrap about the size of an American football. And so we think we can intervene on this pro in this process and protect these filtering units. There is good human data to suggest that uric acid levels in the circulation are playing a role in the genesis of new cysts, but also driving the growth rate of these cysts. We've recently reported this in a couple of animal models, several animal models, mouse and rat models, and reported also a new discovery showing that xanthine oxidase, this enzyme that we believe is intimately involved in the pathology and accelerating the progression of disease, can be found lining um, largely uninvolved tubules, but the lining of cysts as well suggesting it's playing a role in driving the shutdown of these cells, inhibiting the function of these cells by inhibiting mitochondrial function and driving the dropout of the filtering units. And this is an accelerating process. So by uh, 40 years of age to 55, many of the, these individuals have rapidly declining kidney function that, that loses about 50% of the filtering filtering capacity per year as their kidney disease progresses. So this evidence from a rat model of uh, polycystic kidney disease shows an increase in xanthine oxidase expression in the kidneys and an increase in activity of that enzyme. We speculate that that leads to a rise in intracellular kidney uric acid and free oxygen radicals both of those chemicals have been shown to shut down the mitochondria and drive apoptosis, the programmed cell death. So it looks like the kidney may potentially be eroding itself internally. This new discovery and the next couple of discoveries are uh, being incorporated in patents in order to protect the use of this class of drugs, the broad use of this class of drugs in polycystic kidney disease, and in fact, any cystic kidney disease, whether it's kidney or liver or uh, brain. We have good evidence if that if we increase uric acid levels, circulating uric acid levels in a mouse model and in a rat model, that we can perturb, so accelerate the structural and functional changes within the kidneys, in this case, the two kidneys, so the total kidney weight of an animal averaged to their body weight increases statistically when we use oxonic acid to increase uric acid concentrations. And we also see a commensurate rise in creatinine as filtering capacity drops, suggesting that uh, when uric acid is above the normal range, that can act to accelerate both structural and functional deterioration 
in polycystic kidney disease. Now, the next obvious question is, is our formulation of drug able to turn off this uric acid accelerated effect or turn off the xanthine ox oxidase expression and uh, activity level that we observe within the kidney tissue? And the answer is yes, with doses uh, in the human range or slightly higher, we can show a statistically significant decrease in total kidney per body weight. Total kidney per body weight, or in this case, two kidney per body weight, is uh, the measure that physicians use to gauge the status of individuals with polycystic kidney disease and where they are in the progression of their disease. So if we can inhibit the growth of total kidney volume, we can keep people off of dialysis with a therapy such as ours. So this, this data in the mouse, and we have similar data in the rat, suggests that we can turn off this process in a way that is unique and allows us to introduce this first of its class drug into this polycystic kidney disease uh, indication. As, as drug developers, as a pharmaceutical research and development company, we're always looking for agreeing, aligned human uh, clinical study data, there is excellent data to suggest that individuals who have stage two or three or four kidney disease, um, and when you compare autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease patients with chronic kidney disease patients, ADPKD patients seem to have higher exposure to uric acid than chronic kidney disease individuals at any selected status of uh, kidney disease progression. That suggests that this population is uniquely susceptible to uh, serum uric acid harm. There is a very nice study, in fact, two studies that suggest that higher serum uric acid is, in, is associated with increased kidney volumes, and this total kidney volume measure is key to understanding the progression of disease in individuals, and that when serum uric acid is higher, the progression to end stage or kidney failure is accelerated. There are also good uh, reports in a variety of diseases that suggest when serum uric acid is high, that also affects endothelial dysfunction. So the function of the lining of blood vessels that allows them to contract and uh, dilate with physical physiological challenges. So there is an indication that we can help preserve cardiovascular function in these individuals as well. This study is much like uh, about a dozen studies that show when you lower uric acid with a uric acid lowering agent and primarily the xanthine oxidase inhibitor class of drugs. And in this case, they looked at a small group lowered uric acid. They were able to show a decrease in serum uric acid over a one year treatment period. And associated with this was a reversal of the estimated glomerular filtration rate that was about one to three fold what the FDA requires for approval. So these individuals entered the clinical trial losing about 4.5 milliliters per minute per year of filtering capacity out of about 60. After one year of treatment, their glomerular filtration rate had stopped declining and was in fact better than when they entered. This parallels very closely a study uh, in chronic kidney disease showing almost the mirror image of this result. And this study by Goikachia in chronic kidney disease treats about three times as many individuals with a low dose of xanthine oxidase inhibitor. For a 20 month, four month treatment period, serum uric acid was lowered. So they were gaining about half a milligram per deciliter of uric acid more each year as their kidney disease progressed. When you treat them for 24 months, you lower uric acid. And again, the estimated glomerular filtration rate reverses from declining to about threefold uh, this threshold. So this threshold uh, for any clinical trial is about 30%, 33% improvement. So if patients enter losing three milliliters per minute per year of their filtering capacity, and you decrease that by 30%, so approximately 
So they leave the trial losing only 2.2, that's the approvable threshold. In this case, uh, and in the Hahn study that I just showed you, it suggests that for every year treated, you can keep uh, kidney disease from regressing, and that keeps individuals off dialysis. This would redefine how kidney disease is treated in the future. Should we be able to demonstrate this in, in our single phase three clinical trial? And the reason why this is important is if you or I lost our kidneys due to progressive kidney disease, the cumulative survival after a year, so 365 days or 700 days or 1,000 days is poor. Every year you could treat an individual, slow the progression of their kidney disease, and so improve their quality of life and keep them off dialysis would be a method that would redefine how kidney disease progression is treated in the future and be a first in class in this indication. So we're taking a drug that had been previously well characterized but never approved anywhere in the world. We've, we've improved it further with her proprietary oral formulation. We are rapidly working to, uh, toward an orphan drug designation negotiating a special protocol assessment in advance of starting a phase three clinical trial. And we believe that this starting ingredient, oxypyranol, is ideally suited for this purpose because it's not metabolized, which means it doesn't involve the liver to any, any great degree. So liver toxicity signals are minimized. It also works in the circulation, but importantly, uh, intracellularly, so in kidney tissue, to turn off the xanthine oxidase enzyme. We think we have an ideal starting point to advance into that phase three trial. So just touching on the uh, competition, this patient population currently is estimated to be about 150,000 patients with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. There is a single drug approved with an orphan designation. It was approved in 2018. It'll be coming off its designation in 2025. Each individual uh, pays, or the payors pay for each individual approximately $156,000 per individual per year. By treating only about 5% of individuals, uh, Otsuka reported uh, revenue of approximately $700 million. Uh, we believe, given our understanding of this drug, that the addressable population is approximately 40% for our drug in this space. And so we see the 95% of individuals who are not currently treated as being serviceable with this uh, therapeutic uh, option. Tolvaptin is approved. Part of what limits its use in uh, the ADPKD community is a black box warning regarding liver toxicity and a side effect profile that makes it difficult to tolerate and usually is only administered to individuals with the latest stage of um, kidney disease progression. Lixavaptin, which is a similar molecule to Tolvaptin, was abandoned earlier this year because of its uh, non-superiority to tolvaptin. Bardoxolone is under development, but it has had its challenges at the FDA level, and so we don't know uh, whether it will advance. There are early stage uh, programs, early stage two. Uh, we are, as I mentioned, setting up for stage three and think we're ideally suited by the time that this program is expiring to move into the space and be able to address about 40% of the population. We have had a busy year with manufacturing of new tablets in advance of that phase three trial that we have planned. Our bridging pharmacokinetics study is very soon to report part three and part four pharmacokinetics. We've asked key questions with regard to this new formulation, how it's absorbed, how it's distributed, how it's excreted in order to provide information to the FDA and model the population of ADPKD patients in order to select a dose and start that, that phase three clinical trial. We also have worked extensively with the FDA and the European's Medicines Agency to be able to communicate, get their scientific input, 
and set up the, the process of special protocol assessment negotiation in advance of starting uh, this registration trial. We have patent filings that are due uh, very shortly with regard to results of this pharmacokinetic study, with regards to the new discoveries that I just presented, and all of that sets up nicely for um, further advancing this program into late stage clinical trials. At present, the company has about $13 million US. We have about 12.9 million shares outstanding with warrants and options and pre-funded warrants that give us a fully diluted total of approximately 29.7 million shares. So just to recap, we're working in an area that's rapidly growing. Um, with respect to polycystic kidney disease, we think we have a therapy that can slow the progression of kidney disease. Uh, and it's an accelerating disease in a way that would buy years off of dialysis and improve quality of life. In fact, redefine how kidney disease is treated in this space. We think that's equally applicable to um, type two diabetic nephropathy. And given our discussions with the FDA, uh, their guidance suggests that we're in a position with a single registration trial to provide the optimal data that they need for approval of this drug in the polycystic kidney disease population. So I'll leave it there. My contact information is in this QR code and uh, happy to answer questions. Well, you <laughs> some of the questions that came in, you've already answered, uh, Alan. So I'm going to, one of the ones Great. though, is, I think it's important. How long are the trials normally and um, and how long does it take to get approval, say, from FDA once you get uh, past that stage? Right. So the guidance uh, from the FDA is um, one can look at uh, within the within the single registration trial, several endpoints. Um, we have two interim results built into the the study. The first is an open label dose titration that will give us indications of benefits to endothelial dysfunction, to inflammatory markers, and other markers that would indicate um, how, pay, how responsive individuals are with this disease and allow us to enrich for the, the next two parts of the clinical trial. Approximately a year into that trial, we would have a total, a readout on total kidney volume. That may open the door, should we be successful, to accelerated approval. A year later, we would conclude the trial, and that would give us a readout on glomerular filtration rate benefits with xanthine oxidase inhibition. So with regards to glomerular filtration rate, that endpoint needs to treat patients uh, for a two-year period. So if one estimates one year of recruitment, two years of completion of that trial, we would have the full trial completed after three years. However, the interim look would, would look about halfway into that three-year period for total kidney volume and the accelerated approval option. And that's another approach that we've built into the design of this phase three clinical trial. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, this drug, will it stop and repair the damage and bring it back to previous levels or a percentage improvement? You can't go back to the, like, obviously, I don't think you can go back to like a perfect level. Right. So it wouldn't uh, repair your kidney back to a healthy kidney. Uh, but for example, if you started with uh, late stage two kidney disease, the data suggests that as you take this therapy, uh, we're removing the accelerating effect of uric acid levels and overactive xanthine oxidase in the kidneys that would slow the progression or, you know, in fact, the data suggests that, that one would stabilize the disease at that point. And so it wouldn't progress. It certainly wouldn't, you know, it looks like it wouldn't accelerate. And that, that really is the issue. So by taking away the fuel from the smoldering fire, uh, we believe that the evidence suggests for every year of treatment, you have, you buy yourself a year off of away from end stage kidney failure and uh, dialysis. Now, people that are on dialysis now, 
And uh, sadly, I lost my father to kidney disease and dialysis. Now, if someone is on dialysis, would your drug help them? Uh, would it would it help the process? Would it stabilize them further? Or what would happen there? Because the shelf life of doing dialysis, you can't stay on dialysis forever. That's right. Well, um, we don't know the answer to that. Uh, it, it's certainly not something that has been investigated. In concept, um, dialysis is very good at removing things like uric acid and oxypyranol and a variety of things from your blood. So um, if, you're, if you're doing uh, dialysis every second day, it's unlikely that the therapy would be around in your blood sufficiently long or at sufficient levels to, to be beneficial. But again, we haven't looked. It's likely that this is applicable to stage two, three, and four individuals. The, the evidence uh, from other independently run clinical trials suggests that individuals with mild to late stage kidney disease would benefit. Okay. Uh, but once your kidneys have failed, it, it's not likely you probably need dialysis or a transplant. Okay, one last quick question, then we're going to bring Hector back on. Uh, for everybody out there, uh, what are the signs of kidney disease that someone can recognize in their daily life, like so that they can at least address it before your drug comes to market? You know? Is that a question for me? Yes, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I think that I think the the practical answer is there really there really isn't an indication until you're in stage three. Many patients with kidney disease don't recognize any cyst symptoms. Now we know okay. um, we know from blood tests that uric acid uh, levels tend to increase as kidney disease progresses. That that's potentially a marker, but it's rarely measured by physicians. Gotcha. Um, right. Yeah, there are cardiovascular vascular disease indicators that are potential surrogates, uh, but tests like we saw with uh, AVCR may be built in that that give indications, uh, inflammatory markers, markers of kidney disease um, in the blood that could be beneficial. For example, uh, there is an emerging body of evidence to suggest that. Uh, circulating levels of xanthine oxidase are perhaps the single best marker of progressing uh, cardiovascular and kidney disease uh, available. So one might measure in a blood test something mm -hmm. of that. Uh, to, the, to that point, uh, and it is a good point to, to mention, when Health Tab was first started, um, the government of British Columbia and the Kidney Foundation of Canada used HealthTab to study patients in several pharmacies uh, across the Lower Mainland here in, in Vancouver. Uh, we were using a, a different instrument. We still offer this instrument. It's the Abaxis Piccolo, Piccolo <clears throat> but we were uh, we started with that instrument, and um, it was an interesting study. It was around 675-ish patients. Uh, in that study, 11% of the patients had stage three or higher chronic kidney disease. But what was really interesting uh, was that uh, half of those patients, or 60% of those patients, uh, had never heard the words chronic kidney disease. Okay. So they were in the late stages of the disease and, and, and did not know it. So that was one of the first emerging, uh, a paper uh, was published on that and um, you know, it was quite well received, but it definitely goes to show the combination between uh, companies like ours where um, we're trying to facilitate the identification of an individual earlier on. And I'm sure the doctor would agree that the earlier you can intervene with a patient, the, the better outcome that the individual is going to have. If they're at stage four, stage five, then there's not much to, to do. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's an, a very interesting combination as to how um, therapeutics and uh, the pharmacy with testing and screening and consultation with the patient, make sure that you identify them early, but then also therapy adherence. Uh, I'll close with that by saying that we, we're, we're hearing right now there's about a 20% increase in therapy adherence out of pharmacies where the patient is being regularly seen by the, the pharmacist with health tab. And so, uh, you know, it's all well and good. You can get a person prescribed another thing to keep them on the therapy. And so, uh, you know, I think it's uh, uh, gonna be very interesting to see how these, these worlds merge. Well, gentlemen, thank you both so much for today. Very well, much appreciated. Very interesting one thing. topic, yeah. Avricor is listed on the Venture Exchange under the symbol AVCR. 
His Ortex is also listed on the venture under the symbol XRTX. And NASDAQ. And NASDAQ as well. Uh, Sophie, you want to wrap this up? Uh, so we just want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, and just a reminder to those in Montreal, we do have a, a cocktail this evening. So feel free to come join us at the penthouse and we will have more webinars and another live event coming in January. So uh, please stay forward to that. And there will be a live recording of this on our YouTube channel available tomorrow. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Everyone have a good day. Thanks for uh, coming on today. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for your time. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Bye -bye. You. thank you for the Bye -bye. opportunity. Bye-bye.